Conference in New York City for nearly four years, where she in accounts of Calder's visits to Jaffrey. Despite the fact that her book, Willa Cather Living, is an essential source for information about Cather's Jaffrey visits, she strangely often, she's strangely absent and often mischaracterized. 25 years after Cather's death, Lewis had herself buried in the same plot with Cather at the old burning ground. Uh, sorry. In an essay about Cather and Lewis's relationship published in 1989 here in the Little Cather Pioneer Memorial, uh, uh, newsletter. One scholar characterized Lewis's burial there as a kind of intrusion on solitude Cather enjoyed in Jaffrey. Jaffrey was a place to which she, Edith Lewis, was a stranger, the scholar says, and it was a very precious place for Cather, a place where she invited people dear to her, a place where she could be herself. This claim is based in part on the perception that Edith Lewis went to Jaffrey only once to perform the service work of proofreading Mayantania in 1918, an event she describes in Little Cather Living. When Eleanor Asterman, wife and co-proprietor of the Shadow Gang with George, reminisced about Cather's time in Jaffrey, she called Miss Lewis, she called Lewis Miss Cather's secretary companion, and she mentioned her only once, explaining that she telephoned George to arrange for Cather's burial in Jaffrey. She made no mention of Lewis accompanying Cather on visits to the Shadow Inn. Um, I'm not sure where the original of this reminiscence resides, but it's reproduced in this pamphlet here. Uh, five years after Lewis's 1972 death, the Board of Selectmen of Jaffrey petitioned the overseers of the old burying ground to be allowed to place a marker on the unmarked grave of the Secretary of the Cabot. <laughs> Most recently, in 2018, during the centennial celebration of Myantinia, some of you may have seen the musical performance of this play, Kindness and Cruelty, Willa Cather and Jaffrey uh, performed at the old baby house. I haven't seen it, but from what I've read, Lewis is first represented sitting at a desk in Cather's room at the inn, engaged in what seems to be secretarial work. And this image I find really bizarre because I think Edith Lewis is supposed to be on the right, she's, got, she's young and she has dark hair and a bun, and Willa Cather has gray, uh, short bob hair. Um, they were 10 years different in age, but Edith Lewis had a short gray bob and Willa Cather had a bun and her hair never really went gray, but this is the sort of notion I don't know where it came from. Uh, today, I'm here to tell you that Edith Lewis was not Willa Cather's secretary. Uh, as a woman who never learned to type, she would have made a piss poor one. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was she a stranger or an outsider to Jaffrey. Exactly how many visits Cather herself made to Jaffrey between 1940, 17 and 1940 is not entirely clear. So far as I know, the inn's register doesn't survive, and Cather's letters provide clues, but there are gaps. Based on these letters and other archival materials, I've counted at least 11 times between 1918 and 1937 that Lewis accompanied Cather to Jaffrey. 18, 19, 25, 26, 27, 30, 31, 33, 34, and 37. <laughs> Furthermore, if anything, New Hampshire was much more Lewis's place than it was Cather's. Although she was born in Nebraska, her family's New Hampshire roots on her father's side ran deep. The rest of my talk will be divided into two parts. In the first part, I give an overview of my recent book, <clears throat> The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis. And in my second part, I return to Lewis's connections to New Hampshire and to a fuller sense of Jaffrey's place that Cather and Lewis enjoyed together. So there are two strands uh, throughout my book signaled in the title by my phrase, creative partnership. And there, of course, they are on the town of and Jaffrey. First, that his two ambitious career women, Catherine Lewis, created a romantic and domestic partnership that allowed them to enjoy love and intimacy and to pursue their ambitions. Second, that as an editor, Lewis was a partner in Catherine's creative process and also used her expertise in advertising to help craft Catherine's image as an author. This is a page from the Professor's House, Cather's Health for 1925, and all the handwriting is Lewis's. And I like to say that my book really is 50% about this edited typescript of the Professor's House, but there's a lot more for those of you who are reading, so <laughs> don't take me too seriously. Um, my book starts and ends um, at the old burying ground in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, um, but this is in Jaffrey here, just a moment, uh, where Cather and Lewis are buried side by side. I hope by the end of the book, I succeeded in doing mythology about the grave site that has obscured here we go, there is the very slide. Uh, that has obscured uh, Lewis's place in Cather's life. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the talk. Having started at the end with my own first visit to Jaffrey in 1984, which is in the first paragraph of my book, 
when I was a senior at Smith College writing an honors thesis on Tyler. I turn the clock back, introducing Edith Lewis as the young, Willa, uh, the young woman Willa Cather first met in Lincoln, Nebraska in August 1903 at the home of Sarah Harris, publisher of the Lincoln Courier. Uh, this building still stands, I think that's Sarah Harris's mother and brother, but that's the house where Willa Cather and Edith Lewis met. Delving briefly into Lewis's New England family history, I paint a picture of her family's life in Nebraska before she herself emerged into public view as an adolescent studying at the University of Nebraska and publishing short stories in the Lincoln Courier. She's in the lower right-hand corner with her sorority sisters at the university. She transferred to Smith College in Massachusetts, where she met Oxa Barlow, an important character in the book. Um, so there she is again with her literary society at Smith, and here's Oxa Barlow and she graduated in 1902. Chapter two follows Lewis to New York City, where she moved after a year back in Lincoln teaching school, and I trace the growth of her relationship with Cather, both personal and professional, from the first meeting in 1903 through about 1918 in this chapter. So this is actually the corner of Washington Square where Edith Lewis lived and where Will Cather later moved into the same rooming house. The current lentil there, that 60 South Washington Square, is actually really just about exactly the time that Edith Lewis moved there. Uh, from 1906, both Catherine and Lewis worked at McClure's Magazine, and I argue that the magazine office was the crucible um, of their collaborative work on Catherine's fiction. Uh, there's the second place that they lived. They moved in while they were working um, at McClure's, and here is an image of, uh, actually the first document of Edith Lewis editing Willa Catherine. It's a poem that was published in McClure's Magazine. Um, I also argue um, that Catherine and Lewis, in choosing to make a home together in 1908, were emulating Sarah Orange Jewett and Amy Fields, Jewett on the left and Fields on the right, identified by most scholars as the prototypical Boston marriage. In any event, after Catherine left McClure's, Lewis moved on to Every Week magazine, and I recover Lewis's work as an editor of fiction there, including the context of Catherine's fiction. Uh, so on the right is an illustration from my Antonia of Lena Lingard, Bidding and Pasture. And on the left is a story that Edith Lewis commissioned and worked with the same illustrator, W.T. Benda. Um, and you can actually see it's the same woman wearing the same clothes. He's working on the illustrations at the same time with the same model. In chapter three, I turn back the clock to 1915 to tell the story of Catherine and Lewis's shared trips to the U.S. Southwest. Here they are at Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde in 1915. Throughout the book, Lewis's editing of Cavers' fiction is a key theme, but I linger over the evidence here because the first surviving edited type draft of one of Cavers' novels um, is The Professor's House, which was grounded in their 1915 and 1916 Southwestern trips. Here we are again, looking at Southwest, edited by Edith Lewis. Uh, there's Southwestern travels in 1925 and 1926, and also actually here we have a map that Edith Lewis drew in 1915. Their Southwestern travels in 1925 and 1926, and this is them on horseback in 25, inspired death comes for the Archbishop. Although there's no type draft of that novel, there's a rich record of their travel and literary collaboration in relation to that novel. After mining the record of their experiences together in the desert Southwest, I um, focus in chapter four on Lewis's career as an advertising copywriter at the J. Walter Thompson Company arguing that they're advertising for soap and lotion, soap and hand lotion and Cather's fiction are in conversation with one another. Here they are really literally on the same page. That's the Cather's story, Uncle Valentine, and one's home companion in 1925. Uh, and on the right, that's um, Jerkins lotion. And those are photographs by Edward Steichen and all the copies for Edith Lewis. The idea is like you can make your own, you know, do your own housework and still have beautiful hands and step out at nice and uh, impress your company. <laughs> But there they are on the same page. Uh, Lewis started in advertising in 1919, and she and Cather first summered on Grand Manan Island. Oh, and here's also Steichen, sorry. So she worked extensively um, on advertising campaigns with Edward Steichen, the photographer. Uh, and there's those um, hands you can go, and there's Willa Cather, who was photographed for Vanity Fair magazine, um, and that appeared in 1927. Uh, the version of the picture, wait, what summer? Oh, here it is. That pose is the one that people most think of as the pose, but she actually, that's the one that was first published in the magazine, and that's sort of a, an outtake. Uh, Lewis started in advertising in 1919, and she and Cather first summered on Grand Manan Island in 1922. And I'm pretty sure that that's both of them on Grand Manan Island, handing the camera back and forth, although the vegetation, I even sort of tried to look it up, 
here in um, New Hampshire and on Grand Manan Island are very similar. So it's possible this might be New Hampshire, but I do think, I don't think they busted out the, the trouser suits here. I think they kept those for the southwestern <laughs> Grand Manan Island. Um, I devote a separate chapter to their many summers there, both before and after they built their own cottage at Whale Cove. Uh, this is on the cover of the book, and as you see, um, Edith Lewis has hand colored it with it's a photograph of their cottage. She hand colored it with watercolors, and Edith and Willa Cather on the top has written, This is our little home. Cather has been portrayed as living in isolation on the island, but she was living with Lewis, who was actually the legal owner of the land of the cottage. <laughs> Furthermore, at Whale Cove, they were part of a community of women and only women. In this chapter, I focus both on their collaborative work on the collected stories um, that were collected in Oscar Destinies. Here's the beginning of Two Friends, which is edited all in Edith Lewis's handwriting, um, and how both of them responded to the deaths of their parents. And these two things, I think, are really closely related. I see them moving past grief in the 1930s by inviting sisters and nieces to visit them on the island. In my last full chapter, oh, and here she is with her niece, this chapter with uh, Mary Virginia Hall, uh, one of her nieces, on Grand Manan Island. In my last full chapter, I take them back to New York City, where they settled in the large apartment at 570 Park Avenue in 1932. In 1927, they lost their Greenwich Village apartment in subway construction and camped out in an apartment hotel in Greenwich Village for five years before leasing another apartment. They made their lives together there and built relationships with each other's families and with the Menuhin family. So that's usually Menuhin and his musician sisters and parents. Both Catter and Lewis also died in this apartment, 25 years apart. Appropriately, Lewis's profound grief after Cather's death occupies a significant portion of this final chapter. The years after Cather's 1947 death correspond to the Cold War panic over homosexuality called by one historian the lavender scare. In my epilogue, I consider how this context enabled some to deny Cather's lesbian sexuality and to refuse to see Lewis for what she was and what she had been in Cather's life. And I think for me, one of the things that their story demonstrates is I think there's this idea there's before Stonewall and after Stonewall. No, there's before the Lavender Scare. There's the Lavender Scare, and then there's after Stonewall. That they lived in an actually much more accepting world um, than uh, women might have lived in in the late 40s into the 50s and 60s. So, while well, Edith Lewis's mother, Lily Gould, was from a family of Rhode Island and Massachusetts Quakers, so now we're getting to the New Hampshire part again. Uh, her father's family had moved north from Massachusetts in the early 1700s. Henry Lewis's mother was a Lavery, descended from French Huguenot Peter Lavery. There he is. Uh, he was actually the, the son of two Huguenot uh, refugees who came in the early 18th century to Massachusetts. He moved from Salem, Massachusetts as one of the early settlers of Charlestown, New Hampshire. Oops, that's an empty one. Oh, shoot. I had put a picture I took yesterday in there, but apparently um, it didn't work. Uh, I went up to Charlestown yesterday in Fort Four, which is just a reproduction. Uh, but in any event, in 1754, he was in Fort Four when um, the Automaki raided and took captives, including Mrs. Johnson as the published captivity narrative. Uh, he was taken captive by the Abenaki, who handed it over to French Catholic allies in Montreal. So Peter was eventually released, made an indentured servant there, but he escaped indentured and walked 300 miles back to Charlestown. Uh, where he lived another half a century. So Edith Lewis most certainly knew about this family history because Lavery was from Middle Lane. And her sister Ruth Putman Lewis was named after Peter Lavery's wife, Ruth Putman Lavery. Uh, so her father, uh, Henry Euclid Lewis, grew up on a farm outside of Claremont, New Hampshire, um, where he and his uh, brothers and sisters all attended uh, Campbell Union Academy. So here's Campbell Union about the time that, uh, well, about the time they attended. And here's Henry, uh, I think it's his college graduation picture here. Uh, all four fall boys, five boys, sorry, matriculated at Dartmouth College, working their way through by teaching school during the winter term and summers. Only one of them, Arthur, settled in New England. He was a teacher and school principal in Worcester, Massachusetts. The others went as far west as Salt Lake City but they all eventually returned to New England. The one who went all the way to Utah, Eugene, ultimately returned to New Hampshire, purchasing the family farm on which he had been raised in East Claremont. The first brother to die, he passed away in 1907. Frank, who lived in Lincoln with his family next door to Henry's family, died in Concord, New Hampshire in 1909, 
as did Marion Lewis, who had taught school in Omaha for a time. She died in 1915 in Concord, New Hampshire. Edith Lewis enrolled at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts in 1899. So did she uh, visit family in New Hampshire in college? Although I have no definite proof, I guess that she did. From digitized newspapers, I recently learned that she visited her father's sister and her family in Hartford, Vermont. Edith Lewis, a student at Smith College, is spending her vacation at J. Bugbees. There's the information. <laughs> uh, so certainly, if she had gone, um, she didn't have uh, none of her uncles or uh, aunts had landed back in New Hampshire by 1902 when she graduated, but there were still extended family members there. And if she went that far north in Vermont, it seems likely that she would have traveled to Claremont as well. A train ran directly from Northampton to Claremont Junction. And this is actually, I'm pretty sure it's the train that when I was a student at Smith, it was the Montrealer that became the Vermonter. I never went north. I was always going down to New York to change to get a bus to Pennsylvania. Uh, it's also notable that the family of her sophomore year roommate and lifelong friend, Oxa Barlow, had a history of summering in the Jaffrey area. Shortly before <coughs> Oxa's 1910 marriage to Earl Brewster, for example, she was with her family at Mountain View Farm in Dublin, New Hampshire. So Edith Lewis's much, two much younger sisters also spent summers in New Hampshire. Uh, their childhoods were very different from hers because when they were middle school age, the family left Nebraska for Massachusetts. Avid sportswomen, they both trained to be gym teachers at the Sergeant School for Physical Education in Cambridge, Mass. During the three-year course, each sergeant student was required to spend two months during the first two years, June and September, at a sergeant school camp for girls um, near Peterborough. And I'm pretty sure it's now just called the sergeant camp, and the camp is still there. Mm -hmm. So they could learn physical activities less easily conducted in Cambridge, like archery, canoeing, and horseback riding. Edith Lewis's sister graduated, Ruth graduated from Sargent in 1916, while her sister Helen graduated in 1917. There's a cabin at that camp called Willow Cabin. Oh, well, that's right. Oh, well, she, I don't think she's ever there, actually. It should, be, uh, it, should be called, it should be called Edith Lewis's sister's cabin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this brings us up to the moment of Edith Lewis's first documented visit to Jaffrey in 1918, when she read the proofs for my Antonia. Proofreading sounds quite quasi-secretarial, but it wasn't. All surviving proofs of Cather's works that have handwritten corrections on them are marked in Cather's hand, not Lewis's. This means that Lewis was, in the terminology used at the time, the copy holder, the person who read aloud from previous versions of the text, while Cather was the proofreader who marked the proofs for correction. Um, we should not, then, imagine Lewis sitting at a desk as in that play, doing tedious clerical work while Willow Cather was out climbing Mount Manabna. <laughs> Indeed, there would be no need for Lewis to come to Jaffrey at all if she was just going to sit at a desk. Rather, we should imagine just what Lewis describes in her memoir, Willow Cather Living, when she describes reading the proofs of My Antonia with Cather in 1918, not reading proofs for Cather. And this is a long quote. We read the proofs of My Antonia together in Jaffrey early the following summer. Willa Cather liked to read proofs out of doors whenever it was possible, and one could always find convenient rocks to sit against in the woods near the Shaft Inn. Those were wonderful mornings full of beauty and pleasure. I remember how the chipmunks used to flash up and down along the trunks of the trees as we worked, and a mole would steal out of its hole near us and slide like a shadow along the ground. It was very interesting to read proofs with Willa Cather. After a thing was written, she had an extremely impersonal attitude towards it. If there was too much of anything, she was not only ready, she was eager to cut. Of course, a lot of the time it was even Lewis doing the cutting, but uh, she did not cherish her words and phrases. Sometimes she would have a sudden illumination and would make radical changes, always, I think, for the better. She had to pay nearly $150 for extra proof corrections for my interview. It was Cather then, holding the pen, making corrections, but also editing, while Edith Lewis read Cather's fiction aloud. Considering that Cather's novels were often published in the latter part of the year, and they often went to Jaffrey in the autumn, I imagine that the proofs of my Antonia were not the only proofs they read there. Although I do know that they read the proofs for the professor's house in the Southwest, but anyway. Uh, before returning to the end of the story, each woman's burial in Jaffrey, a few other vignettes of Cather and Lewis and Jaffrey, small glimpses from various archives. And I had fun putting this together because I hadn't spent time with some of these details yet. 
So on August 30th, 1919, uh, and this is from the Complete Letters of Willa Cather, which you can all read for free online, uh, Cather wrote to Ferris Greenslet at Hope Mifflin, her editor there, about her progress on her next novel, After My Antonia, which was ultimately published in 1922 by another publisher, Alfred A. Knopf, Inc. She was embroiled in a dispute with Hope Mifflin about those charges for proof of corrections. Lewis mentioned, um, Lewis, Lewis mentioned, and their failure to properly advertise my at least she thought they didn't properly advertise it. Greenslet had reported on the enthusiasm of the marketing director for the novel as Cather was then imagining it. Cather explained that Lewis, who had been working as an advertising copywriter for eight months at that point, had ideas as well. Quote, Miss Lewis said before she left that she could put down some valuable advertising copy in a notebook. I happened to be working hard and forgot to ask her to read it to me, which is a fair sample of human gratitude. Uh, Edith Lewis did not stay in Jaffrey's cabin long as Cather because she had to go back to her Madison Avenue office, but she enjoyed Mount Manadnock with Cather. As Cather noted in her letter to Greenslet, <clears throat> we climbed the mountain before she left. Um, and if anybody wants to read the complete letters, cather.unl.edu backslash letters. Uh, we've got about five or six hundred more to go, but there are 2,600 letters up. And you can read them and interact with them in all sorts of ways. Like you can look up all references to various works or recipients of letters or people mentioned. In 1926, uh, the year of the photo of Gather and Lewis together there, um, it was taken, I believe, by uh, Lois Curtis Nelson, soon to be Mrs. Josiah Wheelwright. Early in the summer, uh, early in that summer, Catherine Lewis had traveled to New Mexico and Arizona as part of Catherine's research for her novel, Death Comes to the Archbishop, which is set in the mid-19th century Southwest. Let's see here. Oh, I can't get the picture. Oh, the picture's there. So you're going to have to look at the picture. I don't have it in order in my slides, but uh, they had been in New Mexico. Um, Catherine had planned to stay and write in Taos after Lewis uh, returned to New York City, but it didn't suit her, and New York City was very hot in July and August. When the Shadigan told her they were booked solid, she asked Mary McDowell to be accommodated at the new McDowell colony in Peterborough. While Cather was at the colony, Lewis went alone to Grand Man Island to purchase the land and make arrangements for the construction of their cottage there. They had rented before that. In September, after Lewis's trip to Grand Man and after Cather's McDowell residency had concluded, the two women met up in Jaffrey to spend time as guests at the Shadigan. So Cather and Lewis are over there on the town common with the old meeting house sort of off to the left out of the picture. You can see the church there, but not the old meeting house. They aren't dressed for hiking. I mean, look at Willa Tyler's hat. It's got this big weird thing on the side. Uh, for, uh, from two surviving letters to George Ousterman, we know that their usual rooms um, at the Shattuck Inn were 234, 324, and 328 in the top floor of the main building. And now we can get the top on the screen, which had a bathroom in between them. Catherine and Lois were conventional enough that they would have dressed for dinner in the dining room. So perhaps they took a leisurely half mile stroll from the inn to the common before or after dinner. Lois's smile suggests that she was pleased with the results of her recent trip to Grand Manan and was looking forward to many summers spent in their own cottage. Her smile was also covering her grief at the death of her father. In July uh, and June, actually, when Catherine and Lois were in Santa Fe, Henry Lewis had died in California, where he was living with Edith's sister, Helen. His body was shipped by rail to New Hampshire. He was interred in Lewis family plot in uh, the West Claremont burying ground. Neither Cather nor Lewis ever learned to drive, but perhaps Lewis hired someone in Jaffrey to take her to visit the grave. In 1927, Cather and Lewis lost their Greenwich Village apartment. Oh, here's our letter to George Osterman, where she says, oh, she's talking about another time, but there are a bunch of letters to George Osterman uh, that are at the University of Virginia. Uh, in 1927, Catherine Lewis lost their Greenwich Village apartment to subway construction and were scheduled to vacation in Rome. After they packed up their apartment, Catherine was called to Nebraska, where her father was suffering badly from angina. And when she returned east, they were supposed to embark for Europe. As Catherine wrote to Mabel Dodge Luhan in Taos, uh, New Mexico, um, oh, wrong one. Sorry, wrote to uh, Mabel Dodge Luhan in Taos, New Mexico, we were still planning to get away in September when Edith's mother had a stroke in Springfield. Uh, she had to be somewhere near her mother, and I was too dead tired that time to embark for Italy alone. So we came up here, a place where I, um, I always love, 
and near enough to the hospital where Edith's mother is. For the present, a mountain full of pine trees and a comfortable country hotel where the management knows me and leaves me alone are enough for me. Near enough meant a train ride to Massachusetts where Edith's mother, Harold, lived in Springfield, brother Harold lived in Springfield, and where he could pick her up at the train station. Cather similarly wrote to a friend, Zoe Akins, who lived in Los Angeles but was visiting New York City, that she flew the coop to this old place in the woods where, we always have, uh, where they're always very nice to me. Miss Lewis came with me. We were both going, born out, going into storage, which is a good idea, like a good, sorry, like a good deal like having a funeral. In 1930, Catherine and Lewis were in, uh, spent nearly six months in France, visiting friends and conducting research for Catherine's novel, Shadow on the Rocks. The novel is set in 17th century Quebec City, but also has an earlier backstory in Paris. In the autumn, their favorite time to visit Jaffrey, they came in via Quebec. And here they are, here she is explaining to George Osterman about this. In Jaffrey, Cather got to work on writing, and Lewis got to work on editing Shadows on the Rock. When Lewis was not on an extended leave from her advertising job that she was in 1930, her schedule could be unpredictable. Uh, her schedule could be unpredictable. In the 1930s, she and Cather generally claimed to wander down from Grand Vinet to Jaffrey in the autumn. However, Lewis was sometimes called back earlier than she expected. In 1934, for example, they made it from Grand Manan to Jaffrey together, but Lewis was urgently called back to the office in October for an advertising writing assignment requiring her special touch. Probably has something to do with beauty products. Um, this brings us to 1936, a year that we know Lewis was not in Jaffrey, because that's when Cather wrote the beautiful letter um, from which I derived the title of my book. And so I am going to allow myself the pleasure of reading the letter aloud to you. Um, so she says, let's go back. Let's see. Oh, yeah. We'll go back to the letter. I'm sitting in your room looking out of the woods you know so well. And I realized when I was doing this that you can actually see there's like a picture of the inn on the top of the letterhead. So the woods are actually on the top of the page. So far, everything delights me. I am ashamed of my appetite for food, and as for sleep, I have forgotten that sleeping can be an active and very strong physical pleasure. It can. It has been for all three nights. I wake up now and then, saturated with the pleasure of breathing clear mountain air, not cold, just chill air, of being up high with the woods below me, sleeping too. And still white moonlight, it's a grand healing. One hour from now, out of your window, I shall see a sight unparalleled, Jupiter and Venus both shining in a golden rosy sky, and both in the west. She not very far above the horizon, and he about midway between the zenith and the silvery lady planet. From 5.30 to 6.30, they are of a su superb splendor, deepening in color every second, and a still daylight sky, guiltless of other stars. The moon not up, and the sun gone down behind Gap Mountain. Those two above in the whole vault of heaven. It lasts so about an hour, did last night. Then the lady, so silvery still, slips down into the clear rose color, glow to be near the departed sun, and imperial Jupiter hangs there alone. He goes down about the thirty. Surely it reminds one of Dante's eternal meals. It can't, I can't but believe that all that majesty and all that beauty, those faded and unfailing appearances and exits, are something more than mathematics and horrible temperatures. If they are not, then we are the only wonderful things because we can wonder. So this letter has been in the collections of the National Willow Cather Center, Center in Red Cloud for decades, which means it has been available to scholars and to all of Cather's biographers. But so still perplexes and angers me that Cather scholars could have read this beautiful love letter, including its evocative opening, I am sitting in your room, looking out on the woods you know so well, and still conclude that Edith Lewis had no relationship to Jaffrey as a place, and indeed had no genuine relationship with Laura Cather. So how did Cather come to be buried in Jaffrey? I'm going to have to, oh, see, things were out of order. Let's go on to, we're back to 1936. There's the Oh, and there's the currents. That's the annex of the Shattuck Inn, right? Um, and you can see there's Manadnock 
right behind it. And so they had their rooms up at the top, but in a building that looked like that, but was not that particular building. <coughs> so um, according to Eleanor Ousterman's reminiscence, this is quoted in this pamphlet, before she died, Miss Cather made a special request. Edith Lewis was to call the Ousterman's and ask them to arrange her to be buried in the old burying ground behind the meeting house. Recall that Ousterman also remembered Lewis as Cather's secretary companion. So certainly one secretary would not sign in West final resting place. However, it was Lewis, Cather's primary heir and literary executor, who did the, make the decision. And I'm relying here on the letter from Edith's sister, Ruth, written to the brother Harold immediately after Lewis' death. Uh, which is to say an account contemporaneous with the events, not a later reminiscence. So there's nothing in Cather's will about her wishes in this regard, and although she was diagnosed with breast cancer in December 1941, had a mastectomy in January 1946, and had learned sometime before her death that she had metastasis to the liver, she had not expressed her wishes to Lewis. I think both she and Lewis seem to have been avoiding these five conversations, focusing on Cather's living rather than on her imminent death. In the difficult hours after Cather's death, Lewis recalled that Cather had once said she would like to be buried at Jaffrey. Although Lewis recalled Cather having expressed such a wish, it was not expressed in the way Eleanor, Eleanor Ousterman recalled. And despite Ousterman's claim that Lewis called George Ousterman seeking assistance, it was Cather's actual secretary, Sarah Bloom, who made the call. Lewis had asked her to come to the apartment after Cather's death to help with arrangements. The fact that Lewis decreed where Willa Cather would be buried evidently made Lewis' sister's sister Elsie very nervous. So E.K. Brown, whom Lewis had commissioned to write an authorized biography of Cather, uh, took a research trip to Nebraska. And in Omaha, he spoke to uh, the wife of uh, Harvey Newbranch, a journalist in Omaha. Um, and Evelina Newbranch relayed back to a competing and unauthorized biographer, Mildred Bennett, that Brown, quote, had said that Willa had made no plans at all and that Miss Lewis had not the slightest idea what to do, but at last hit upon the idea of Jaffrey, where they had spent so many happy summers. So Ruth Lewis's letter to Harold Lewis at the time of these events tells the stories in, story in exactly this way, right? She's like, what should I do? Oh, Jaffrey, I think maybe she said that once. That's where she should be buried. But Elsie Cather felt compelled to write letters, a letter to E.K. Brown in 1949 stating the facts. Most of the letter consists of a long, convoluted story about how Willa had intervened and disrupted a plan to transport their brother Douglas's remains to Red Cloud when he died suddenly in California in 1938. And all of her brothers were in California by the 1930s. Douglas had once told her that he wanted to be buried in California, Elsie explained to Brown, even though he had never told anyone else. In explaining this to another brother, Roscoe, Willa told him that she had no intention of being brought home herself that she wanted to be buried on the mountain in New Hampshire near the inn where she and Edith used to spend their summers. In relation to Willa's own death and burial, Elsie continued, we were all very sad that Willa did not wish to be brought home, but we respected her wishes, and we knew it for almost 10 years. Elsie was particularly anxious to correct Evelina Newbranch's impression, quote, that a heartless family had refused to extend a welcome even to the dead, and that Edith did not dare to bring her home, which simply is not true. Willa had made her own plans 10 years before. If, as Elsie described, Willa made plans in such a definite way, why didn't she purchase a plot? Or put her wishes in her will? Or express her wishes to her partner of 40 years? It seems pretty clear to me that what really bothered Elsie was the idea that Willa's family was ashamed of her. And the source of that shame, Cather's partner of 40 years, decided her remains should rest elsewhere. So Edith Lewis was also responsible for Willa Cather's grave marker. Her old friend, Rudolf Ruzica, a wood engraver and type designer who had done the jacket design for Cather's last three published works of fiction, here they are, drove her up to Jaffrey and helped with the design of the tombstone. Lewis herself died on August 11, 1972, 50 years ago, tomorrow, and her sister Helen Lewis Morgan respected her wishes expressed in her will. Quote, my remains are to be buried in my plot in the burying ground in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, near Jaffrey Common, beside my friend, Willa Siebert Capital. She also specified, quote, no headstone or marker be put over my grave. And now we return to 1977, the moment when the Board of Selectmen of Jaffrey petitioned the Board of the Old Burying Ground 
be permitted to place a marker on the unmarked grave of the Secretary of Old Cabin. So Edith's sister, had, uh, Helen, had set up a perpetual care arrangement for the plot purchased by Edith Lewis in 1947, so she sort of re that, uh, in which both she and Willa Cabin were buried. And in 1977, Helen was still alive. Nevertheless, no one contacted her about this marker. People who did not know Edith Lewis at all, uh, who thought she was Willa Cabot's secretary, placed a marker. Because the cemetery regulations, the marker had um, a flat, had to be a flat one placed at the foot of the grave. Um, and they didn't even get her birth year right. So here it is. She was born in 1881, not 1882. They were probably calculating based on her age in the New York Times obituary without knowing that she was born in December. Within a few years, Cabot scholars were writing about how Edith Lewis had herself buried at Cabot's feet. I don't have any pictures of that, but that is what I saw. I saw the foot mark replacement in 1984. In fact, through reading the 1989 essay I mentioned earlier in this talk, Edith Lewis's niece, Helen Morgan Schulte, found out that a marker had been placed and wrote to the trustees of the cemetery to protest. After some negotiations and resisting the idea of removing the marker entirely, they agreed to relocate it next to Cabot's marker. And this is what you see there. And I took these pictures in um, 2011, which was my second visit here. A few years ago, the marker was moved back to its um, original position, but there was also uh, another marker made for Willa Cather, and then there are corner markers, right, so that you can accurately see um, where both of the women are buried. But we still have the wrong birth date, wrong birth year for Edith Lewis. Of course, Cather's birth year is also wrong because she didn't even tell Edith Lewis when she was really born, and she'd been lying about her age for years. <laughs> um, but um, nobody asked. Nobody asked um, Edith Lewis's family, or you know, just nobody asked. Um, not that I think her family would have objected. Um, one of her nieces, who died a few years ago, lived in Vermont, Vermont as was a great niece, a retired University of Vermont librarian. Uh, they were a family very proud of their deep New England roots. And being buried in New Hampshire, Edith was less than 60 miles from her parents' grave in Claremont. So this is where I went yesterday. I tried to find them a while ago, and I couldn't find a burying ground in West Claremont, but I found the right cemetery. Um, the story of her parents' marriage and its seemingly bitter end is mentioned in passing in my book. And though it's perhaps plausible that Lily Lewis asked to be buried by her husband's side, I'm inclined to think that the children decided to bury her. Henry's siblings are all buried in Claremont, as was her sister Ruth. She was very close to Ruth. Um, and here we have the whole Lewis family plot with the parents, and then not all of the children, but the majority of the children, and then some of the next generation as well. But why would we expect adult children to be attached to their parents in death? I actually had somebody tell me once, and um, it was we were in Bladen, where G.P. Cather, Willa Cather's cousin, who died in World War I, his wife, Myrtle, um, insisted on his remains being brought back from the battlefield cemetery where they were interred, and there's this big thing. And someone said, we should bring back Willa's remains home. And I was just like, no. <laughs> Her partner decided where she was going to be buried. She doesn't have to, like, should we all be buried in Mesopotamia or something? We're all going to go back to our parents. But anyway, um, uh, so, but I think that they rested together as a couple where it was that they wanted to be here. And so I'm going to read to you as my closing here a letter from um, Edith Lewis to Metcather, who was the widow of Will's brother Roscoe, that she wrote in June 1947 about um, the placement, about the uh, arrangements for Will Cather's uh, internment in the grave. I am here in Jaffrey this weekend to see about having the deed drawn for the cemetery lot and to arrange for its perpetual care, etc. I wish you could see what a lovely place it is where Willa is lying. Just at the corner of the old burning ground, so there's the corner, she describes. And on the other side, a lovely hemlock tree and a tall white birch beyond, which we no longer have that, so I'll give you a better distant view, because all those trees obscured what she was describing. Beyond the stone wall of the ground, drops to a little meadow of waving green rye with some old apple trees. And from there, you look off to green fields and woods and the beautiful mountain with the light always changing on it. And it was very cloudy this morning. The little burning ground itself is rather wild, but so much more cheerful and pleasant than most carefully tended ones, with beautiful old trees and lilac bushes everywhere and wild flowers in the grass. 
it does not seem lonely and set apart. It just seems a part of the village and the human life around it. Thank you.